All right, praise God. Well, I'm just really excited to be able to share this message with you. I really believe in my heart this is one of the most powerful messages that basically is being communicated today. And not because it's anything that I have done, trust me, it's nothing that I've done. But something I did stumble over, and by doing so, I've led many atheists and agnostic uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ recently. And you're like, well, you know, how do you lead an atheist or an agnostic to Jesus Christ? Well, one thing, you have to care, and you have to be honest with them. You have to say, look, I understand that if you don't believe in God, there's a reason why you don't. So one thing you have to accept that that's their state right now. It doesn't mean they're going to stay in that state of mind or that frame of mind forever. But we have to acknowledge as believers that, you know, I don't know if you were raised from a little baby to believe a believer, to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, not all of us have been believers our whole lives. We remember when we didn't believe in God. We remember that maybe it took a revelation. Maybe it took a dream, a vision, uh, some experience that just turned things around where our minds finally concluded that there's no way, that there's not a God in heaven that loves us, that made man for himself and has a purpose and a plan for each of us. And that if we will seek him, he says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will be found of me and I will turn your captivity. So a lot of people, they don't think they're in captivity. That was one of uh, uh, different people's in the Bible's issues is, you know, they said, you know, who made you a ruler and a judge over us to Moses? Because they were saying, look, you know, we're not really in bondage to Egypt. We're not really making, you know, uh, mud and bricks uh, and straw. I mean, you know, mud and straw into bricks. I mean, and they were in denial that there was any captivity. They were in denial that they were in any addiction. They were in denial that things were not going the best way possible. So a lot of people are just simply in denial as to what's going on in their lives. And the truth of the matter is when any of us come to the truth, John uh, chapter 3 talks about that those that come to the place that instead of men loving darkness because their deeds are evil, it says they come to a place where they want to find out if their life is okay with God. Is Does God approve of my life and will I make heaven or will a uh, surface down below be my home? And some people think, well, I don't believe in there's a hell because I don't believe there's a God, I don't believe there's a devil, I don't believe in anything. Well, just... You know, underneath the ground, there are volcanoes. And it doesn't look like, you know, wherever that molten fire comes from, it doesn't look good. So just in case that hell is down underneath the earth, you just don't want to go there anyways. The Bible says whose ever name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be cast into a lake of fire. And the Bible says every knee will bow to Jesus Christ of things in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So whether you believe in Jesus or not, if you're atheist and agnostic, God is telling you one day, whether you're at, up here or in the middle section here on earth or down below, whatever that is, if it's mermaids swimming in the water or it's you know fire like what comes up from a volcano down below, one day, no matter where you're going to be, you are going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you can be like, well, this is how you reach an atheist. You just try to scare us into heaven. No, I'm just saying this is what the Bible says. But then this is where I want to now stop and help you. Because, you know, what? if there's a God in heaven and he loves mankind, the Bible says he's not willing that any would come, uh, would perish, but all would come to repentance. So God's will, if he got his druthers, if he got his perfect will, is that no nobody, no flesh would perish, but all would come to a turnaround. That's what the word repent means. It's metanoia in Greek. It just means simply a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of direction. It's like a 180 degree. So 
you know, again, you're probably listening to me like, oh, you're not going to convince me. I've heard all you guys. You explained about the Trinity, you know, being like an eggshell. And, you know, you told me about that, you know, there's only six days of creation. I can see clearly there's millions of years. And uh, you can't tell me UFOs aren't real because I've seen them. You know what I mean? I've felt their experience. They've done, you know, uh, Area 51 and, you know, Project Paperclip. And, you know, I know all this stuff is real because I've studied it. Okay. So a lot of people, because of their intellectual uh, property, which is in their own mind, okay, they think they've come up with a conclusion that just makes sense to them, and it makes much more sense than the Bible. And I understand that. At one point, I did the same thing. I was like, God, I don't see enough evidence that you're real. And you're like, Bart, you're a pastor. Well, I am now, but you know, I wasn't always a pastor, and I had come to the conclusion through what I thought was my own brain and my own knowledge and understanding that there was no God. And with that knowledge and understanding, I told God if he was real, I said, you need to prove yourself to me because otherwise, you know, I, I'm lonely. All my friends are out partying, getting drunk, getting high, having sex, you know what I mean? And here I'm at home alone trying to figure out if you're real or not. And it seemed like I went, you know, over a year Basically, at home, trying to read my Bible, trying to be the best I could possibly be. I read a verse in uh, Matthew, I think it was 528 or 522 or something. It said, unless your righteousness would exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, that you wouldn't make heaven. So I thought I just had to be good and gooder and goodest. And by doing that, somehow God was going to be like, you know, hey, that's my requirement. You're a good guy. I'll let you in heaven. I didn't realize at the time that the Bible says that all of us have sinned, all of us have fallen short of God's glory, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. All right, well, Bart, so, so all the stuff you said, I know you're trying to convince me the reason why I need God, that if I don't get God, I'm going down below, and uh, you're trying to throw in little things to get me to think, but you said you've led atheists and agnostics to, to the Lord, right? Well, you know, tell me how you did it. I'll see if it's real. I'll see if you can convince me. And so, come on, bring it on. You know, I want to see what you got. So, anyways, so really, I do have something that is supernatural. And, you know, you have to be able to explain things. So that was my big conclusion, whether it was a God or not, that I told God, I said, if you don't give me something that I can't, with my mind, back up, okay? Like, I could come up with, well, this is maybe the reason why this happened, or this is an explanation of this. I mean, if I could come up with a logical conclusion why, if a supernatural event supposedly occurred, or someone claimed it did, I could always come up with reasons. I could reason my way out of miracles, signs, wonders, the Bible, preachers, Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, you know what I mean? I, I figured out a way in my mind to just reason everything out. Well, God decided, you know, to kind of trick me, okay? So I basically made a promise to God. I told him if he would, um, I was getting ready to be caught with drugs, okay? This is when I was younger, okay? It's okay now I'm a pastor now, you, you know, I don't do that stuff anymore, but I did, okay? I drank, I did drugs, I, you know, had sex outside of, you know, marriage. You know, I had a lot of issues, okay? And I still have a few to today, but I'm working on it, okay? Anyways, so I made an agreement with God. And I told him this. I said, if you can come up with something to communicate to me that I can't reason my way out of, okay? I said, as long as you make it as clear as can be, and I can't use my mind to reason my way out of it, I said, I will serve you all of my days. But I, I put the challenge in God's hand, okay? So a friend of mine, you know, and, and I had my own beliefs, and I, I, I came to the conclusion I didn't think God spoke to anybody today. I believe that really the only true version of the Bible was the King James, if there was one, okay? And I came to the conclusion that after a while I didn't believe at all. But for a while, I did have that conclusion. I also came to the conclusion 
that if there was a loving God, that he had to have provided a way for mankind to approach him without, you know, this being just good enough to do so. Because I tried it. I walked little old ladies across the street. I mean, I gave money, time, resources, effort. I tried to pray. I tried to fast. I tried to, you know, do everything I knew to do. And I was miserable. And I told God that. I said, God, if you're real, you know, I'm doing everything I know to do in my power to have my righteousness exceed the scribe and Pharisees. I just thought a scribe or a Pharisee was like a minister or a priest. You know what I mean? I was uh, in the Catholic, uh, you know, youth uh, club. You know, I played soccer with uh, the CYC, the Catholic Youth Organization, Catholic Youth Council. And uh, so I had seen priests. I had seen, you know, Methodists and Lutheran, you know, ministers and men of the cloth in a sense. And so I just thought, well, you just have to be good. I thought maybe I'd go to seminary. Maybe I'd, you know, find out what it is these guys are learning. Maybe then I would feel in my heart that I would feel complete, that I'd be at rest. And the Bible actually says, and I'm not just telling you this to just freak you out, but it's in the Bible. So if I can convince you that the Bible really is true in the Word of God, okay? And uh, then if I quote it, <coughs> it should be something that you could believe. Anyways, I should have grabbed some water and I'm in a room by myself and I've got uh, the door blocked. Anyways, <coughs> that would have been a great idea, but I think I'll be all right. Anyways, so I put God to this challenge, basically, for him to prove himself, okay? Something I couldn't back up. And so the scriptures themselves became, became kind of a quandary to me because, you know, I could clearly come up with stuff, you know, that would throw God off, I thought. I'd be like, well, what about this scripture? You know what I mean? And what about this? You didn't expect me to believe this, do you? And what about like Jonah and the whale and Noah's ark and, you know, a snake and an apple? You know what I mean? I would throw things out to God, basically, like, you know, how can you expect me to believe these stories are really real. So, I mean, you've got to convince me of it. You know what I mean? So basically, in my challenge, a friend of mine gave me a book. <clears throat> Excuse me. The book was called The Harvest, The Prophetic Word for the 90s. And uh, this book, as clear as could be, was claiming that this man, his name's Rick Joyner of Morningstar Ministries, okay, and uh, I'd never heard of him. And a friend of mine kept giving me this book trying to say, you know, look, I know you don't believe all this stuff, but why don't you at least read it and maybe it'll help you. And again, I had made this agreement with God and I reemphasized it the night I read The Harvest. And I had actually skimmed through its pages, you know, and what I put into it basically is what I got out of it. Meaning I really, you know, after skimming through it, I really didn't read it closely, okay? And what I put into is what I got out of it, which was nothing, okay? So it didn't help me in my faith or my belief. Well, I was home from work, and some of you have heard this story before, but I re-emphasize just because this really happened to me, and so I'm sharing an experience, okay? Um, and uh, oh, and also, I don't know of a title yet for this, but I honestly think this is like the revival revival, okay? And you're like, well, what is that? The, the revival revival? And I think I'm entitled, I might entitle that this because, you know, there's been like a Brownsville revival or let's say Airport Vineyard revival or Lakeland revival or Asbury revival. There's been different revivals, you know, through the years all the way, you know, back in the early 1900s in California, the Azusa Street revival. So sometimes it was a street name. It was the town name. I know in Topeka, Kansas, uh, things took place with Charles Parnum. Uh, I know... Uh, there were different, you know, people through the years that rose up that people began to follow. William Branham was one of them. Uh, uh, there was a ladies, Marie Woodworth Etter. Uh, there's history that she froze in St. Louis for three days while she was pointing her finger, okay, out. And, and like she was preaching and she froze. I think like it's at the World's Fair or something. And they actually know the very spot. Right now there's like a, you know, like a geoengineering place in its location. But for three days and three nights, basically, she froze in place. And people would walk around her, you know what I mean? 
Like, there's a woman frozen. Come check it out. And, like, hundreds of people walked around her while she was frozen in place. So she didn't eat for three days and three nights, and she just froze. Well, the people that were around her when she came to, it's like she continued her message from three days ago and, like, kept talking as though nothing had happened. Okay, I don't know if she was, knew she was frozen for three days. But anyways, so kind of unusual things. Um, Amy Semple McPherson. This woman arises out of nowhere. Catherine Kuhlman. Uh, there was different people just through the years that their names kind of stand out because, you know, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they made a difference. There was a whole group called the Kansas City Prophets that a lot of people thought, well, you know, they were not very profitable. There was all this controversy between them. Bob Jones, Paul Kane, John Paul Jackson, uh, Mike Bickle was in that group. Um, just a lot of, of, of very unusual happenings. Anyways, through all these years, you know, men have, uh, that are Christians, okay, have desired this end time revival. And that's why I think I call it the revival revival, because I don't have a name for it. So that's what I'm just throwing it out. Um, some people might call it the 515 revival, just because the word revival has a V1V in the center of it. And vive means to make alive again, okay? Anyways, so I know I've gone around in circles or whatever, but so when I read McTorm's book, The Harvest, what I put into it, I got nothing out of it. And so basically, I put it aside. Well, I was home for my the birth of my daughter for about three weeks. I was working for AT&T at the time. And uh, I had developed laryngitis. And the laryngitis is because I literally couldn't talk because my nostrils were full. My, I mean, you know, like when, when you have like where you're congested, I was so congested. My throat was just horrible, sore throat. So I really couldn't talk, couldn't communicate. I didn't want to be outside with anybody. And here I'm waiting for the birth of my daughter and uh, I'm off work. So I cleaned the house, I cleaned my room, I cleaned the yard, I cleaned my tools, I cleaned, you know, everything I could think of, and uh, I wasn't around any people. So basically, one night, and it was May 14th, okay, of 1995, no, it's a long ways ago, but this is what happened, and it was 11 o'clock exactly at night, I pick up this book by Rick Joyner of Morningstar Ministries, and this time I just started on page one. And I began to read it. Well, as I began to read this, okay, and if you've heard my testimony, praise the Lord. Listen to it again. Maybe I'll say something that I didn't say before that'll fill in a, a dot or a hole or make sense to you. But anyways, I read the first four chapters between 11 and midnight. And at midnight, I literally closed the book. And I said this to God. I said, God, you know, all these years I've been telling you, if you can prove yourself, you know what I mean? I told him, I'll quit drinking, I'll quit smoking, I'll quit getting high, I'll quit having sex. You know what I mean? If you'll just reveal yourself to me, I will, you know, do this thing. And uh, uh, anyways, and I was married at the time, so I wasn't having sex. So just so, you know. Anyways, so when I read for those four chapters, I was convicted afterwards. And I simply prayed. I said, God, I said, if what this man wrote is real, this really is the prophetic word for the 90s, and you gave him these dreams or visions, and there really is an end time harvest, that Jesus Christ is really going to come back, that, you know, there's a preparation for that. I just said, I really do want to be involved. I want to be in on it, okay? I want to be in on it. That was my prayer. But I said, uh, the original agreement was still, but you've got to prove yourself that you're real. I need something strong that I can't reason my way out of. Well, anyways, so I went to bed that night at midnight after my prayer. I went to sleep. Well, I woke up, you know, somewhere between, you know, maybe 2 and, and 3.30 in the morning. And normally, I'll be honest with you, I just sleep all the way through the night. I, I'm a very good sleeper. And uh, my wife's a harpist also, and so she would play a harp a lot of times at night, so I would just fall asleep to the harp music. And my wife did harp CDs, and so I'd sometimes listen to the CD, fall asleep. So anyways, so that particular morning, which was the morning, I had the hiccups, so now I don't have anything to drink, so just bear with me. So um, between somewhere between 2 and 3.30 in the morning, all of a sudden I wake up. And I can't go back to sleep. And that's unusual for me. So I sat up in my bed just like this. And I was awake. I was fully awake. And I just prayed and I said, God, I said, 
I said, if you want to get something through to me, I said, I'm willing. You know what I mean? I'll, I'll sit here and, you know, I'll raise my hands. I'll, you know, pray, whatever. But if you want to, you know, do something, I'm available. You know, I don't know what you do to reveal yourself, but I'm, I'm here now if you want to do something. And he did something. I mean, I, I was really kind of amazed. It's like, really, God? You know, like you like literally hear our prayers. And honestly, all of a sudden, this beautiful presence just came down. I could feel it. I could clearly feel it. it was like, you know, I didn't feel like wind blowing against me, but an atmosphere literally came down like this. And as it did, you could cut my body like in one half because one side of my face was still all congested. My nose was stuffed up. You know, I mean, I could just feel, but all of a sudden when this, when this atmosphere came down, the whole right side of my, just all of a sudden everything cleared out. Like my ear, like cleared out. My drainage cleared out. It was just gone. It was just, it was really weird. And all of a sudden my right ear pops open. Like, I mean, when I'm saying pop, I mean, like I could actually like almost like hear it. It's like pop. And a voice spoke to me. At that moment, and I heard these exact words, I heard the effect of every vision. Now, this was internal and external, but it was a voice, okay? All right? My wife's asleep laying next to me or whatever in bed. She's nine months pregnant, so she wasn't in any mood to be woken up in the middle of the night, even though she was about an hour later. But anyway, so this voice says the effect of every vision. And while I'm awake, sitting up in my bed, there is literally now a man standing at the foot of my bed, okay? So I heard these five words, the effect of every vision. Then there's a man in front of me. He's got a turban around his head. His eyes are open, but there's no pupils in his eyes. It's like white looking scales almost, okay? And uh, then I see hands laid, so the thumbs over his eyes, the hands on the head like this. I hear the effect of every vision, a man standing there, shall be retained no longer. When the hands are removed, the man's eyes open up and he was able to see. Well, after that happened, I mean, I heard an audible voice. I gra oh, grabbed open a, a drawer that had a torn envelope. I grabbed a pen that was in there and I wrote down on a torn envelope. I kept that torn envelope in my wallet for years after that showed all kinds of people exactly that I wrote. I showed my wife time and time again. Remember this? You know what I mean? She's like, I remember it. Put it back in your wallet. Anyways, and it said, the effect of every vision shall be retained no longer. So it was exactly five words that a man in front of me in five words. Now, when I call it like the, the revival revival, and I say the V1V is 515, to me, it's kind of like the 515 revival. And I call it that simply because it was on May 15th, after reading Rick Joyner's book, The Harvest, that God revealed to me that the harvest is real. Now, I thought, since he audibly spoke to me, it was like the end of time. This is in 1995. And honestly, for like three days, I blasted everybody that I could blast. You know what I'm saying? I mean, all my old friends knew it's like, okay, Bart is finally lost. He's saying that God talked to him. You know, let's keep some distance from this guy to see if he ever recovers, which I never did recover, by the way. I, mean, I love it. Anyways, so three days later, exactly on May 18th, then I'm just upstairs in my uh, living room. My wife's laying on the floor. We're playing with her belly, me and my two-year-old boy, Daniel. And I all of a sudden hear, the vision shall speak at its appointed time. And I'm like, oh my God, I just heard a voice speak. And the vision will speak at its appointed time. The effect of every vision shall be retained no longer. That was May 15th, three days later. The vision shall speak at its appointed time. Well, in those three days, I didn't know there was an appointed time when the vision would speak. The vision was already speaking and I was driving people for three days. You know, anyways, you know what I'm talking about. So... Then an hour goes by on May 18th, and I hear, again, the same words repeated. The vision will speak at its appointed time. And then I hear, though it tarry, wait for it, it will surely come to pass. Well, that itself was amazing because I didn't feel any presence. I wasn't sick. Everything got cleared out within those three days. 
Um, and actually on May 15th, when God spoke to me, my wife woke up next to me because I was, when, when that power lifted off of me, which I thought, because it just, you know, felt like it was on me, and then it was spoken, and then I wrote down an envelope, and then I stayed in it for probably maybe an hour or so, just basking in this beautiful, wonderful presence. I knew no now is the power of the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know at the time uh, really fully what it was. Anyways, and uh, so here I'm now, when that power lifted, my body began to physically shake. And you're like, well, you know, demons cause people to shake. Well, let me tell you something, you know, uh, it was not demons, it was the power of God. You, you, you can tell when God touches you, anyone who knows about his presence. Anyways, and uh, so my wife wakes up and she's like, you know, hey, I'm nine months pregnant, please, you know, get out of bed and go, you know, you know, go to an exercise, you know, like, you know, go drive and to an exercise place. You know what I mean? She's just like, you know, wasn't really connecting the dots. And I didn't tell her <coughs> in the middle of the night what happened to me. Okay. So anyways, so May 18th, I hear the vision will speak at this appointed time. Uh, an hour goes by, I hear the vision will speak at this appointed time. Though it tarry, wait for it, it will surely come to pass. So I realized that there really was an appointed time. There was a timeline and I didn't know when it was. So throughout the years, I was like, you know, well, God, you spoke to me. You revealed these things to me. And there were times I remember one time I was so hurt. I was like, you know, God, did I like mess up? You said the vision would speak at its appointed time. Was I supposed to speak about this? Was I supposed to do something? Did I pass it up? You know what I mean? So Years went by. I think when God spoke to Abraham and said, you know, that he was going to cause his children to be like the stars in the sky and the sand in the sea. And here, you know, uh, Sarah, you know, he said it would, he, Sarah would have a child. And, you know, Sarah didn't have a child for like 25 years, okay? Then all of a sudden, the Lord shows up with two angels, uh, says that Sarah's going to have a child within a year, right? And, uh, hello? Uh, she laughs and says, right, you expect me to believe this? And she got in a little bit of trouble because the uh, Lord's like, uh, you laughed. And she says, I didn't laugh. And he was the child who was named Laughter. That's Isaac. Anyways, so I didn't know it was going to take 25 years, okay? 30 years. It'd take a long time. It's already been like 29 years. So next year will actually be 30 years since God originally spoke to me. Okay, so Bart, what does it mean? Like, you know, you're claiming that this is enough to convince me that God is real. You could have heard some voice. I mean, even if you heard a voice, it doesn't mean it was God. It doesn't mean it was Jesus, the Holy Spirit, an angel. You know what I mean? It could have been the devil. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of factors involved. People have asked me. And I do ask the question, well, if it was the devil and the devil is real, then maybe God's real also and maybe the Bible is the word of God. Well, I don't believe that. I've heard people say well, if the devil's real, it makes sense that there's a God in heaven, okay, that sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross and shed his blood for you and I because he died on the cross to deliver us from the devil, okay? Anyways, but that's still not what totally would convince everybody, and I understand that. You don't know me. You don't know my level of integrity. You don't know my hours in prayer before God or my time in the scriptures or the personal revelations that I've received because you weren't there. The, the six or seven times that I've met Jesus in dreams or visions. You weren't there when I've heard the audible voice of God, you know, uh, three or four times in which I heard an actual voice speaking to me and then found the scriptures afterwards. You don't know about the dreams and visions that I've had in which I've seen things come to pass years before they came to pass. When I wrote my first book, it was 270 pages. I sent it to my publisher and they called me back and they're like, we can't print this. You, you're talking about Bush is going to be the president. Uh, there's going to be uh, this, uh, you know, two, you know, I, I, I put two doves flew into two buildings, okay? But I saw something take place and you couldn't like reveal it fully all the way back before the turn of the century. And I saw a war take place after that. So that was all in my book. And uh, my first book is called Following Your Dreams Toward Your God-Given Destiny. Well, the publisher, you know, he's like, hey, you know what I mean? Take your book, split it in half, 
everything that you say is going to be in the future, don't put it in the, you know, in, in the second book, put what, I mean, sorry, split it up and none of this future stuff can you put in the first book. We'll publish the first book, okay, but you can't have anything that hasn't yet happened, okay, before we publish it. But if the things you sh have revealed and showed that you had dreams and visions about, if they're real, then we'll publish your second book. So my first book was published in 1999. It did contain two white doves flying in to two buildings, okay, all right? Um, and uh, it did, uh, my next volume talked about George Bush becoming president, talked about the Iraqi war, and many other events that took place. Well, that still doesn't convince me. Oh my God, I hear you guys talk about all the time, your dreams, revelations. That doesn't mean there's a God. It doesn't mean heaven's real. It doesn't mean you're real. It doesn't mean you're not lying. It doesn't mean you're not the seed. And I've heard those things, and I, I'm telling you, that's why I'm speaking in your behalf, because I understand. Now, this is something that's a little unusual. So let's go all these years now in advance. Let's just say even none of that happened, even though it did. Okay, through the years, I kept asking God. I said, God, if it's the appointed time, please let me know. Probably like Abraham, he's like, Lord, if I am with my wife tonight, is this going to come to pass? So maybe he didn't want it to come to pass for a while. I don't know. Maybe they had a good marriage. I'm kidding. Okay, it was. It took 25 years. You know what I mean? And and Sarah said, Shall I, you know, have pleasure with my Lord? And at 99 years of age, and I think he was 100, you know what I mean? Like, really? You're going to give me a child? And I'm like 100 years old. Maybe Abraham was 99. I'm not sure it could have been either one. But, and it says she laughed. Why? She laughed in unbelief. And either the angel of the Lord said, you laughed. And she's like, I didn't laugh. And, you know, either the Lord or an angel said, no, I heard you inside the tent. You laughed when I gave you this promise that you were, you know, that... Uh, your husband uh, through you that you were going to have a child within one year because you didn't believe it. And I'm sure Sarah's like, hey, I didn't laugh. And the Lord's like, I heard you laugh. So maybe she laughed on the inside and the Lord heard it. Anyways, the child Isaac that was born within a year from the time of the promise, his name meant laughter. So he was Abraham's joy. He was Sarah's joy. And everybody laughed when they saw him because like a 99 and 100 year old man and woman have a child, so that brought joy. Well, Bart, again, I appreciate you. Thank you for going through Abraham, Sarah, and all that stuff. I've heard those Bible stories before. What about Noah's Ark? Come on, really? You believe there's a bunch of animals, you know, two drafts sticking their necks up, you know what I mean? Birds flying through the sky. If there was only two on the ark and one of them was sacrificed, then that cuts off, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, because the Bible says that Noah sacrificed animals when he was on the ark. So it's like, oh, there goes that species. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, the rhinoceros, there's only two rhinoceroses, you know, and they've been, you know, knocking everybody with their horns. Can we sacrifice one of those? You know, his wife and his kids probably said, he's like, yeah, I think let's go ahead and just sacrifice that big animal with the horn. Well, then there wouldn't be any rhinoceroses, right? So what I'm saying is, is that I'm having a little bit of fun with you, but Okay, so what about Noah's Ark? You really believe that? Well, I kind of do. Uh, the, it actually gives a date when Noah's Ark rested, okay, uh, on the mountains of Ararat. And it says when the waters came out and they rested on dry ground, so there was a place for the boat to rest on the mountains of Ararat, meaning the mountain range of Ararat. It says it was like the 17th day of the seventh month, okay? Well, that's kind of crazy right there because you have to go forward in human history. And are you ready for this? It was the 14th day when the lambs were chosen in Bethlehem for the sacrifice. That's when Christ was crucified. And he rose on the 17th, okay? And you go back and look. So the ark rested and then go all thousand years forward. And it's the exact timing of the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, by the way, is Easter. So literally, this morning, early morning, okay, some people say it was Saturday morning, Sunday morning, it doesn't really matter. It was three days and three nights that Christ rose from the dead. So in a sense, today, you know, I don't think July 17th, because it's 
the Hebrew calendar, which is a little different than ours. But anyways, it's pretty amazing. And you've got like a month called Nisan. Hello, we drive a car called Nisan. If you don't believe stuff like that, that's kind of cool. All right, so Bart, where are you going with me? You've talked about the car. You said you'd give some type of uh, proof that I, as an atheist or agnostic, and you said you can convince you convince these people just with your words, and they come to faith in Christ and become born-again Christians filled with the Holy Spirit, evidence of speaking in tongues, and they only hang out with you for one half hour, and all of a sudden their whole life is transformed and changed? I don't believe that. Well, I'm telling you that even though I haven't seen the full manifestation of everything, I have had many people come to full faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. One guy was a Sikh for 30 years from India, Within 30 minutes, he became a born-again Christian. Another lady, she was an atheist, became a born-again Christian. Agnostic, born-again Christian. A man agnostic, born-again Christian. Within my car, just with a short time, spending time with them, you know, praying for them, giving them some information, within a very short time period, I was able to share something with them that made so much sense that they became a believer in Jesus Christ. Well, it's already been, my gosh, 36 minutes. So going on 37 minutes. So 37 minutes, I'm going to end this video. And if you're an atheist or agnostic, go to part two, okay? I'll, I'll say part one is the the revival, revival, or, you know, uh, how to convince an atheist that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, or an agnostic, or I don't know what I'm going to title it yet. I'll see, but I'll probably do part one and part two. So I just want to tell you that go to the next video if you really want to know. And if you don't want to know, don't go. But, you know, I wanted to know. I really did. And remember, whatever the attitude when I read Rick Joyner's book, The Harvest, is the attitude that I received from it. And the first time I read it, I had no faith or no belief whatsoever. The second time, it just convinced me more greater to pray and ask God for help. And when I did, I'm claiming that God audibly spoke to me the scripture, Ezekiel 12, 23. It was on May 15th, which is 515. Uh, and, and remember, there was five words, the effect of every vision, that a man standing in front of me with a turban wrapped around his head and scales over his eyes shall be retained no longer when the hands are removed. So it was literally a five, a one, and a five. Well, the scripture was Ezekiel 12, 23 on May 15th. And it literally says, the days are at hand and, okay, the effect of every vision. Another 515. So that alone was very weird. In, in one moment, I've got three 515s that are now kind of staring me in my face. And 5 plus 1 plus 5 is 11. So really, it's 11, 11, 11. So my next video, maybe I'll share with you how I met Jesus, okay, in November of 2022 in Jerusalem in a dream. He took me to Jerusalem. He stood in front of me with a military commander's uniform. It had like, I think they call them like labels or, or, or tablets or something up here. You know, it had like, you know, kind of these things. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, like in the military. So he actually had those on his outfit. And, uh, he had this, like, you know, military commander, like a commander of troops outfit on. And when I recognized him, I literally screamed in his face, you're the son of God. Anyways, check out part two, all right? God bless.